Okay, so that's a face. Any other questions on or something that we might have left out in the, in the, in the face? Mitral phases, another student favorite. That's when a patient has reddish discoloration around the cheeks, which could be a sign of pulmonary hypertension, most likely secondary to severe mitral stenosis, leading to the pulmonary hypertension. And for some reason, which I don't know about, how it then only affects the capillaries in the cheeks, giving you this reddish discoloration um, in the cheeks called the mitral phases. Just to put it in context, if there is no mitral phases or no red discoloration of cheeks, it does not rule out a mitral stenosis. So if it's there, I would think about it and have a make sure I check for it. If it's not there, it means nothing. Okay? So be aware of that. Anything else? Yes. Um, the book names on Dutekia and Kaiser, why would you check for that? That is some diseases like uh, oops, uh, clotting diseases or some diseases of the gut can give you some petechia inside the mouth. Yeah, so that's also something you can look out for. Good. Right, now we get to the neck. The three structures we want to investigate for cardiovascular diseases or uh, conditions is the carotid arteries, the JVP, and the trachea. And I'll get to that in a moment. So, Starting with the carotids, I asked the patient to lift his chin up, and the carotid arteries are located just lateral to the thyroid cartilage and medial to the sternocleidomastoid, right at posterior. So the way to find it easily, put your fingers next to the thyroid cartilage and go straight back, and you'll be on the carotid artery, that you can feel the pulsation nicely there. And the carotid artery is a big artery, so you can get a nice idea of the volume and the character of the pulse over here. All right. You can examine it both sides, but not together, otherwise the patient could have syncope. Okay. Not such a crisis if he's in the bed, but I mean, not a nice feeling. All right. So, we feel for the carotid artery, um, just to get a better idea of the, of the volume of the pulse. And he's got a good, nice, strong volume, as we already found during the water hammer pulse test. Right. Then I want to get to the... JVP, which is a critical examination component of the cardiovascular system. The jugular venous pressure is an indirect way to get an understanding or a gauge of what is the pressure like in the right atrium of the heart, or the right side of the heart. Remember, the blood is not pumped back to the heart, it comes back with passive processes, like contraction of the muscles in the limbs, with valves in the veins moving the blood only in a direction towards the heart. Also, positive abdominal pressure also leads to the blood moving towards the heart. It can't go down to the legs because of the valves, so it moves up towards the heart. And the fourth one that's important is the negative intrathoracic pressure sucking the blood essentially back to the heart. The heart, as a pump, is not involved in getting the blood back to the heart. That's an important thing. So it, it, it comes back passively. Obviously from the head and neck it's gravity. Unless you walk on your head, on your hands, then you need, you'll have a problem because your head will explode essentially, eventually, because it can't get back. There's no valves there. All right. So what we need to understand is the JVP and how we interpret it gives an understanding of what the pressure is on that side and how the blood's coming back there. If the right side of the heart can't cope with the returning blood, the pressure in the right side of the heart, the right atrium, will go up and up and up, and it will be reflected in the JVP. So, how do we do the JVP? First of all, we ask the patients to keep their head straight and look towards the left, and make sure that the patient's chest, neck, and head is in an aligned fashion, in one line, and their neck and head must be relaxed. You can't have a tensed up sternocleidomastoid muscle, it must be relaxed. Okay, so a good position pillow is important. All right. Then, for me to see the JVP in a good way, I need to position myself in a plane that will make the wave come perpendicular to me, to pick it up easily with my eyes. So I position myself here next to about the patient's head, looking across the neck to try and see if I can see where the JVP is. Now, I've consented this patient before to make a little mark of where the JVP is, and in this case, I can see the JVP quite easily. Relax, Reineke. Okay, it's not ideal, but anyway. And I can see it's pulsating over here. And we make a mark, or you, you must consent the patient, of course, but it's at this top end of, of the JVP, which is about there. Now, 
how do I measure the JVP? So here's my little mark. I'm just going to, for the camera, just give you an estimate. It's about on that height there. So I feel for the sternal angle, where the manubrium and the body of the sternum comes together, there's sort of a, it's also where the second rib attaches. And that point there is my reference point, which I can mark. And I measure the vertical height of this point above the sternal angle. And in this case, it's about three centimeters. Now that means that the pressure in the right atrium is approximately 8 centimeters water because the distance between the sternal angle down to the right atrium is about 5 centimeters. And because blood is more than 90% water, the, the height of the blood is essentially the pressure in centimeters water. So it's a similar pressure. So in his case, we always report the JVP the amount of centimeters vertical height to the pressure. So in this case, three. So his JVP is three. Talion O'Connor says three is the upper limit of normal. Some books like Harrison's uh, in Eternal Medicine goes up to five. But let's work with three, which is Tally teaches. So three centimeters JVP is his JVP measurement. So that converts to a pressure of three plus five, eight centimeters water in the right atrium. Yes, John. Because you're using the sternal angle as a reference point, does this mean you can't do this test in a person who doesn't have a normal chest, like your final chest and your... Yeah, that would be a difficult one, a final chest. Luckily, that's very rare, but you're right. I think you need to get a gauge of where is a good place to take that measurement. It will be more difficult than a patient with a deformed chest, absolutely. A nice way to think about where is this 45 degrees angle is what they also mentions is where the base of the neck, sort of the clavicle and the sternal angle is sort of on a very similar level. Then the patient is sort of in a good position for yourselves. Okay. So 45 degrees. How do I know that this was the JVP and not the carotid pulse? Well, the JVP has a flickering waveform because of the AV waves that you see, AC waves that you see there. And also I can't feel the JVP pulse. It's not palpable, as opposed to a carotid pulse, which is definitely palpable. And the carotid pulse, if you look at each wave, it's just an up or down, like that, as opposed to the JVP, which is sort of this flickering, as I mentioned. Also, the JVP one moves around. So if the patient takes a deep breath, it will drop down. If, he does, if his JVP is not raised, it will drop. Because of the, negative, the increase of negative pressure in the thorax drops the pressure and the JVP goes down. I can also place my hand on the abdomen and put a little bit of po extra positive pressure down, which we call the abdominal jugular reflex. And because I'm adding a bit of extra blood to the right side of the heart because of increased abdominal pressure, the JVP will transiently go up and come down if the right side of the heart is compliant to have a bit of extra blood arrive. If the JVP is already increased and you add a bit of blood it will increase further and stay there because the ventricle or the right atrium can't handle the extra blood really. That's why the pressure goes up. So the principle is that if you add blood to an already overflowing or increased pressure JVP, the pressure will go up and it will stay there. So that's the abdominal jugular reflex. And the same principle is if you take a deep breath and the JVP does not drop but it actually goes up, that's called Kushmal sign, which means you've also pulled extra blood into the thorax, but the heart can't handle it, so the JVP pressure goes up. You would have expected the pressure to drop with a deep breath of the patient. Okay, so that's the JVP. The waveforms of the JVP is explained in Talian O'Connor, and I'll mention just the three big ones again at the end of the discussion. The cannon waves, the giant waves, and the large V waves, relating to the tricuspid valve on the right-hand side. Okay, then we move on. Now that we're in the neck, the last one is the trachea. The trachea is important in cardiovascular because it is an estimate and it's a beacon of where the superior mediastinum is. Now the heart itself is nested within the mediastinum. So if the mediastinum shifts, the position of the heart in general will shift. So I need to feel, and I'll teach you this in, in respiratory exam as well, how to feel for the trachea, but I need to just feel, in, in Reinecke's case, the trachea is beautifully central. So I know the heart is in the normal position in terms of its centrality in the thorax. Then I move on to the chest, and here I do my basic inspection of the chest, looking for midline, 
uh, for a uh, stenotomy so, uh, sign uh, operation scar or when they open the chest for big cardiac surgery, lateral thoracotomy sign uh, scars, maybe a pacemaker or a deformity of the chest in the front. And in this case, it's all good and normal. Now I move on to my Z maneuver, which is essentially, if I can draw here, and there's the aortic valve position, pulmonary, tricuspid, and I'll get to the mitral in a moment. So I put my flat of my hand over here, over the aortic and pulmonary valve areas to feel for thrills. What is a thrill? It's a palpable murmur, which means the turbulence generated by the murmur inside of the heart is so severe it produces a palpable feeling, like a distorting speaker that you can feel the vibrations. And in this case, I can't feel anything at this stage. Then that's the one sort of leg of the Z. The, the, the vertical one is where I feel with this part of my hand, just left of the sternal, for a parasternal heave. And I just put a little bit of pressure on the sternum, not trying to do resuscitation, but just a bit of pressure on the sternum to see if it rises like this, give that heaving rise. Now a heave, either right or left ventricular heaves, is indicative of thickening of the ventricular muscle. So the parasternal heave is an examination for a patient with right ventricular hypertrophy, because the right ventricle sits under the sternum. When we get to the apex beat, if you have a heaving apex, that is a left ventricular thickening, an RLVH. Left ventricular hypertrophy gives you a heaving apex beat. We'll get to that in a moment to the apex. So that's the parasternal heave. Remember in the context of a patient with COPD with a barrel chest and hyperinflation, the diaphragm is pushed down in that condition, and you actually, because of the barrel chest, the distance between the sternum and the right ventricle is enlarged with some air from the inflated, hyperinflated lungs, and you won't be able to feel a parasternal heave even if the patient does develop right ventricular hypertrophy, secondary to pulmonary hypertension of that condition when corpulmonale is starting to develop. In that case, you would feel for an epigastric pulsation where you place your fingers in the epigastrium and try to just put it under the ziphy sternum and because of the diaphragm being flattened and the right ventricle sitting on the diaphragm you feel a superior inferior pulsation on your fingers which is indicative of a right ventricular hypertrophy as well remember the other pulsation in the abdomen is the posterior anterior transmitted fe sounds feeling <coughs> in the aorta deep in the, in the abdomen okay so now I feel over the, that's, I've done that part, I've done this part of the Z, and now I feel over the tricuspid and mitral areas for thrills to see if there could be any murmurs palpable over here. Now, at this stage, I can get a good idea of the tricuspid area, but I need to find the apex beat to get to the mitral area. And what we do in this case is, if the heart is enlarged, the apex is normally quite easily palpable in a displaced manner away from where we would normally expect it because if you can imagine the heart enlarging towards the left side it will push easier against the chest wall and you'll feel that diffusely displaced apex beat because it becomes diffuse, not a nice focused area like the ventricle but the ventricle is dilated, becomes a more diffuse, a bigger area that it actually pulsates against the chest wall. And remember the definition of the apex beat, it's the most inferior lateral pulsation palpable on the chest wall caused by the heart. Now, I normally just feel around widely to make sure I don't miss an apex beat that sits over here. So I just feel quickly if I can feel any pulsations of the heart around this wide area here. And then I move my way up to water where I would expect it to be and I push the pectoral muscle up and feel over the expected position which is in the fifth intercostal space mid clavicular line and here I can feel it very nicely on Reinecke which I would expect it to be quite hyperdynamic okay so once I find the apex beat I now count the ribs and how we count ribs is next to the sternum onto the level and then go across do not go across the breast in a female you go parasternal and under okay so there's the sternal angle second rib third rib fourth rib, fifth rib, actually fifth intercostal space nicely and in the mid-clavicular line. 
Okay, so there we go. Yes, Dan. Um, in Tali it says that you only find the egg, or you only help the eggs between 50% of yes. the sugar. Yes, so that's a very important point. Okay, so when you auscultate for the mitral area, would you look in the yeah. anatomically correct place? So if you have a good technique, and that's very important, with the trachea being central, so the mediastinum is, is in the correct position, and if you examined and you felt it with a good technique and you can't feel the apex peak, you could probably assume that the heart is not enlarged and in a normal position, um, unless the heart could be on the right, which is very rare with dextrocardia. But in, if you can't feel the apex peak, we normally turn the patient on the left side and feel them because then it should become much more easy to feel. So in Reinecke's case, I can feel the apex peak there, so I'm happy it's on the left, and given the sternum being, you know, the heart, that is about where the uh, right side of the heart is. It's a normal heart size. Okay. Now that I've found my mitral area here, I need to talk about two things of the apex beat. Its position. Luckily, I found it in this position, so it's normal. But the character. You get a tapping apex beat in a mitral <coughs> stenosis because of that forceful opening of the and closing of the first heart sound. And you, it's like a tap. When, the, when, a, when a valve closes forcefully, it can produce turbulence and you can feel it. Sometimes over the pulmonary area, in pulmonary hypertension, it's, the valve also shuts quite forcefully and you, feel, you can feel a palpable second heart sound here over the pulmonary area. That's a good sign of pulmonary hypertension. Similarly, if you feel a tap over the apex beat, it could be a forceful closing of the mitral valve, which is associated with mitral stenosis. Okay, a very loud... S1 essentially. Okay, and if it's a heaving apex beat, which means if you put your fingers on it and lift your fingers like that, then it's indicative of left ventricular hypertrophy. Heave equals hypertrophy. And obviously, if it's a displaced apex beat, it's heart, mostly heart failure, where the volume overload has dilated the ventricle and you feel a diffusely displaced apex beat. And that's normally the incompetence of the valves, aortic or mitral, leading to that volume overload and displacement. Okay. And obviously now I can feel for thrills over it, which I can't feel. So that's the Z-track maneuver. Thrills, heave, thrills. And heave at the end. Okay? Now that I've finished that, I do not do cardiac percussion because it's not a very useful sign. It's part of the examination, but it's not very useful in a context with a patient who doesn't have a huge pleural effusion and a displaced apex beat. So even if I percuss on the heart, it's actually quite resonant. You can't, it, it might be right over the heart a bit dull, but you can't really delineate where the heart really changes. So it's not a great sign, it's not very useful. Tally says it's not as accurate. Nice way to determine heart size, trachea, an apex beat that gives you a good indication. Okay, now we go to, on to auscultation. Now for auscultation, the only area where we use the bell as well is when we listen over the mitral area. The bell of the stethoscope is designed to pick up low frequency rumbles. So we can listen with the diaphragm for high pitch blowing sounds and high, we, this is our default listening device if I can call it that. And this is the one we use for low pitch sounds, like a mitral stenosis. So, I would listen here. Start with the mitral area. That's the S1 area, so the AV valves here. And I put my finger on the carotid to get an idea of where systole is. And I listen to the first sound, and I also try to look at the second sound, but I focus on the first sound over the mitral and tricuspid areas. <coughs> Then I can turn it around and listening for a mitral stenosis. No diastolic rumble all over here. Now I will turn the patient on the left hand side to do the first cardiac maneuver, which is turn on the left hand side. And we position the patient on the left and put the right hand behind, like it. Don't have it hanging over here. Put it behind the patient over here that it exposes the chest. And now I just re feel again quickly for where's the apex beat should be very easily palpable. Yeah, there it is. A bit more lateral because it displaces a bit now because of the positioning of the patient. 
And what happens in this case is that the heart, because of the turning on the left side, the atrium is now positioned much more vertically over the ventricle. So the vertical vector over the valve is increased, which will increase the flow over that valve. Just a very tiny bit, but if there's a murmur, it will accentuate the murmur. All right? And it's closer to the chest wall. So now I listen again over the mitral area with my diaphragm and my bell. Great. Good. If I hear a blowing systolic murmur, you should put your fingers there, you can try and follow the murmur's radiation if it goes into the axilla, which is classic in most of the cases in a mitral incompetence murmur, which is a systolic murmur. Okay. Let's bring the patient back. I'm not going to do this now to save a bit of time, but we will then lis listen over the tricuspid, pulmonary, and aortic areas with our diaphragm. Okay? And then, lastly, we would also then listen over the carotids after we finished with the aortic area. Because if it's an aortic stenosis, you'll get a murmur that radiates into the neck because that's the direction of blood flow. Murmurs always radiate in the direction of the blood flow. So systolic murmurs is normally in the this direction and diastolic murmurs is in this direction, all right, as a general rule. But if I hear a murmur here in the aortic area, then I can just listen here if it radiates up into the carotids. If I hear nothing over the aortic area and I now I hear a <laughs> over here in one, of one or both of the carotids, it's indicative of a carotid stenosis, which could be a uh, uh, arteriosclerotic plaque causing stenosis of the carotid arteries here. Okay, so I normally listen to the carotids after listening to the heart to see if it's a carotid-induced sign or if it's a radiated um, uh, sound from the possible moment. Yes, Joanna? This might seem a bit similar, but <coughs> it always confuses me. How do you decide that S1 is S1 and S2 is S2? Well, the easy answer for that is, as S1 is produced by the atrioventricular sounds, when you put your finger on the carotid, the AV sounds, the valves between the tricuspid and the mitral need to close, then you get systolic emptying of the blood in your stroke volume, and then you get the closure of the pulmonary aortic valve. Oh, yeah, the pulmonary and aortic valves. So, <coughs> so having your finger on the carotid here is very helpful because S1 is just before the pulse and S2 is just after the pulse. So it's lip, tsh, dip, A1, 2. So they're either side of the pulse. All right? You need to put your fingers on the carotid if you're in the early stage of your career to help you immediately pick up where you are in the cardiac cycle. Remember we did that practice session where you had to time the murmur to the pulse. If it's on the pulse, it's systolic, the murmur. If it's between the pulses, it's diastolic. There's luckily just that one or the other. There's no third option. So that's auscultation of the heart. Then we've done the first cardiac maneuver, left lateral for mitral stenosis accentuation. Now I'm going to set the patient up, please. And what I do here is two things. Firstly, I ask to put my fingers, Randy, can you put your arm down there? I put my fingers over the aortic pulmonary area again to feel again for thrills, but I ask the patient to sit forward, exhale, take a deep breath, exhale, and hold, so that the chest wall has got bringing, the base of the heart comes closer to the chest wall. And keep your head up. There we go. Okay, no thrills, palpable. The next one is incompetence murmur, which is an early diastolic decrescendo murmur. It starts loud, goes soft very quickly. And because if you think about it, there's the aortic area and here's the apex, which means this is the direction that blood will flow, it falls back from the aorta into the ventricle, goes, it will fall towards the apex, isn't it? Because that's the left ventricle. So I'm trying to take away from the camera. I'm trying to catch. I put my stethoscope in the left parasternal area to try and catch that regurgitation wave, if I can call it that, or sound that travels towards the apex. You can start here as well, but it's good to listen here. Deep breath, exhale, and hold. Okay, can't hear it as well. For the back, Renick, if you just put your legs down here. Basically here we also inspect for skeletal abnormalities, 
kyphosis, scoliosis, which is not that a major issue for cardio, but for respiratory it can be a big issue, stab wounds, operations. That's where we would inspect from here. And then we would feel for sacral edema, if the patient has been bedridden for a while, and that's the lowest part of the body where fluid will accumulate. Okay. With auscultation, we listen to the basis of the lungs for bi-basal, both of them, crepitations, fine um, late inspiratory crepitations, which is a sign of, can you remember, pulmonary edema. But sometimes in the elderly patients, there can be a bit of fluid collection. So we just ask the patient to give us a good cough. <coughs> there we go. And that will clear any residual fluid that's in the base of the lung. So we ask the patient now when I'm listening, and I'm not going to do that now fully, to take a deep breath. Then we will try and pick up that fine expir uh, inspiratory crackles or crepitations in both of the bases, which will be a sign of lung, lung edema, pulmonary edema. If the patient, that's, and also that's left heart failure will give you lung edema. If it's right heart failure, the patient can have pleural effusions. And the way you pick that up with auscultation just as a screening exercise is that there's no air entry or very decreased air entry either bilaterally or one compared to the other side. If you, if you hear that there's no air here that you can hear and there's a good airflow here, then you suspect there could be a pleural effusion, which is fluid in the pleural cavity then you need to do formal pleural effusion investigation with percussion and further tests. But that's, you just screen the back with your stethoscope for those two things with auscultation. Okay, lie down quickly for the last phase. We try to lower the patient to try and lower the bed. Now remember, you can't always lower the bed for all cardiac patients. If they are heart failure patients, they'll become acutely dyspneic. If you can, luckily this young man can still lie down. We try and flatten the patient for the abdominal examination. Now, we're going to formally do gastro exam, and then I'll show you exactly how to examine for hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and ascites. So for now, I'm just going to mention what you would do in cardio. You want to determine the size of the liver. Heart disease, heart failure, tricuspid incompetence can give you a big liver. A tender, swollen liver is normally heart failure related. A pulsating big liver is very indicative of tricuspid incompetence because that pulse wave from an incompetent tricuspid wave is transmitted into the liver. So we look for a big liver, we look for a big spleen, so splenomegaly can occur in infective endocarditis. Then we would also feel for an epigastric pulsation, maybe a big uh, aneurysm of the aorta, or epigastric pulsation superior and inferior for right ventricular hypertrophy in the context of a patient with hyperinflation and a barrel chest, developing core pulmonale with pulmonary hypertension. We can also auscultate just two centimeters above the umbilicus on both sides for a renal artery stenosis, which is an important cause potentially of hypertension. So the patient is hypertensive and young, you can lose, you listen for bruis over the renal arteries. You can also do it from the back because the kidneys is retroperitoneal. That's an alternative way to try and listen for the, for the renal arteries. Remember the bruis is a systolic sound as the blood passes through a stenotic area. And then we do examinations for ascites because right heart failure can also give you ascites. Then after the abdomen, we move, We can go to the groin and just listen over the femoral arteries. And if there is a pistol shot, it's indicative of aortic incompetence, which is, if you listen over it, just go, pow, pow. that's that hyperdynamic pulse wave that passes through the femoral arteries and you can hear it. It's just another hyperdynamic feature. Um, and we feel for the arteries, and then we go to the popliteal arteries. But I would normally, in terms of, seeing if there's blood supply into the legs, just go straight for the foot pulses. And with the two foot pulses we palpate bilaterally is the dorsalis pedis, which surface anatomy is a centimeter lateral to the extensor lucis longus in the midfoot here on this ridge. Just this, a gentle palpation, not pressing hard, you'll, ob you'll not obliterate it, you will occlude it. So just a gentle feel there, and there I can feel the pulse. That's the normal position of the dorsalis pedis. 
and then the posterior tibialis pulse is located, its surface anatomy is a third of the way from the inferior edge of the medial malleolus to the calcaneus, top edge, a third of the way, quite deep, you can feel the, for the pulse in there. And he's got a very nice foot pulse. And you would now examine bilaterally to get to that. Also, you need to examine in the legs is look at the lower legs for signs of effusion and swelling. Now remember my rule as I explained to you, if the swelling is symmetrically and bilateral, it's a systemic cause. Heart failure, low protein. All right. If it's a unilateral swelling in one leg compared to the other, it's normally not difficult to pick up that this leg is more bigger than the other one. You look for a regional cause of that swelling. Either a tumor potentially in the pelvis obstructing the blood vessels and lymphatic drainage, a blood clot in a deep vein, or other obstructive cause of the lymphatic tissue causing or cellulitis infection here causing unilateral swelling in the leg. Okay. So we need to investigate for a DVT if we find evidence of a red swollen leg unilaterally. So DVT is an important thing to look out for in the legs. The other one, as I mentioned, is the Achilles tendon. To feel if there isn't a thickened Achilles tendon, it's normally about a maximum, about a centimeter thick, but we need to investigate for that. The other <coughs> one that you need to think, if you have edema in the legs, you need to grade the edema, and we do that with the level of pitting of the edema. So, putting your thumb over the bony tibia, not the soft tissue of the tibialis anterior muscle or the calf muscles, but on the bone, you try and just make sure it can be tender that you warn the patient that you're going to just gently press down until you reach the level of the tibia. Take away your finger and see if your finger marks remain and grade the dipping or the, the pitting of that edema. If it's very deep, it's 3 plus, 2 plus, 1 plus, you can just see your print and zero like him. There is no swelling. All right. So that's pitting of edema. Then we also investigate the toes and the distal part of the foot for exactly the same as the things in the fingers, except tar staining. That will be very difficult in a patient like this. Okay. So clubbing, cyanosis, splinter bleeds. Although remember the toes take a much more trauma beating normally than the fingers. Be aware of that, but we examine the toes also for that. And the last thing you need to do in cardiovascular examination is take the temperature of the patient, because it could be feverish, which could be infective endocarditis. Measure the dipstick, the urine dipstick, for blood, infective endocarditis, and other, other causes as well. Nephritis, nephrosis can give you signs or positive findings on your urine dipstick. And we look into the eyes, into the fundus of the retina to look at the blood vessels for diabetes, hypertension, and infective endocarditis. They can get bleeds and uh, it emitters changes in the eyes on the retina. And that's the end of the clinical examination. Thank you very much. Let's take a break. Was that